Well, good morning. These are good stories, aren't they? Ordinary people, amazing stories. Um, Now, for anybody coming into this series for the first time today, or anyone here who's not completely familiar with what BLESS means, what it's about, um, one thing you can do is, um, on our website, you can listen to the podcasts of all the preachers that have happened before, and actually even better than that, we've got a BLESS page, and all the videos of the talks are on there as well. So that would be an excellent way to catch up. Uh, but let me recap for you as well. Um, so the thing is that as followers of Jesus, for those of us who are followers of Jesus, and I'm, I appreciate that doesn't necessarily mean everybody here today, but we are on mission. Whether we like it or not, whether we know it or not, we're on mission. We're on Jesus' mission. And what is Jesus' mission? His mission is to reach people who are far from God. It's to restore them and the world around, and then to reproduce the mission in others. That's Jesus' mission, and we exist as a church to see ordinary people changed by Jesus to change the world. So we're about reaching ordinary people. Changed by Jesus, because that's how restoration happens, and then to change the world, that's about reproducing that mission in others. That's the mission of this church, that's Jesus' mission, and we as individual followers of Jesus are commanded by him to take ownership of that mission and to pursue that mission in our lives. For that mission to be the starting point of our purpose every day, the thing that gets us out of bed in the morning. But of course we know it's often not the case that that's the thing that gets us out of bed in the morning. And we sometimes find this rather difficult. And if you say the word evangelism, for some people that makes you recoil in horror and fear. But that's where bless comes in. So in Genesis chapter 12, right back at the beginning of the Bible, God tells Abraham, I'm going to bless you so that you can be a blessing to the whole world. And the same is true of us. We have been blessed to be a blessing to those around us. We've been given much so that we can give much away. And that's always been God's strategy, right from the beginning and all the way through history. It's always been his way of bringing restoration to the world is through blessing. And we're using the word bless to stand for five very simple missional practices. So be Means? Begin with prayer. Well done. B is begin with prayer. So we've been encouraging everyone in the church to write a list of people in your life, neighbours, friends, colleagues, family, who don't know Jesus. In fact, we got over there the result of of all of that, you know, all those lists, thousands of names on the wall over there. And then to commit to pray for them every day and to pray for their blessing and to pray for opportunities for you to bless them. And also to be praying, Lord, who can I bless today? Who are you going to bring across my path today? How can I be a blessing to the world today? So begin with prayer. L, listen. listen. So listen. So spend time listening to God for those people on your list. But also, crucially, be intentional about listening more than you speak in interactions with people. Because when you listen, you hear about people's hopes and dreams and their struggles and their hurts and where God is already at work in their life. So listen. E, Eat together, because when you sit down over a meal or over a coffee, you build relationship in a far deeper way. It's amazing the power of doing that to build relationship. And actually, you also place great value on the other person or the other people when you open your home to them. When you sit down, you take time over a meal. So eat together is really important. The first S is serve. Because when you spend time praying for people regularly and you're listening to them and you're eating together, they'll tell you how to love them. And opportunities will arise to serve them. And that is about being Jesus to them. It's showing the love of Jesus to these people in your life. And then the second S is story. Share your story. Because when you're intentionally and regularly doing those first four steps, then you will get opportunities to share your story and that's where our focus is going to be today but the aim is for this to become a habit for us that this just becomes part of life these these missional practices of bless it becomes second nature for us so that I don't know if somebody says to you you know I get that you go to church but how do you do the the reaching out how do you do the evangelism bit oh well we bless people it's just the natural response we bless people and we all know what it means and that's the thing bless is evangelism And anybody can do this. If you're doing this, you are doing evangelism. And anybody can do it. Anybody can pray. Anybody can listen. Anybody can eat together with others. Anybody can serve others in many different ways. And then we come to share your story. Now I guess for many of us, this would be the most challenging of the five missional practices of BLESS. Because it involves actually talking to people about Jesus. And it feels like there's a greater level of risk 
attached and a greater level of courage that is required for this particular step. There's a well-known quote, and I'm sure many of you have heard this or seen this before, and it's uh, usually attributed to St. Francis of Assisi, where he says this. He says, preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. Now, we know the point he's trying to make. He's trying to say, look, your life, the way you live your life, should show people what God is like before having to use words. But I think a lot of people use a quote like this as a cop-out. It's an excuse to not have to speak about Jesus, an excuse to keep quiet. You know, I don't talk to people about Jesus because, well, that's a bit pushy, isn't it? It's a bit, it's a bit off-putting. We don't want to force anything down their throats. We don't want to, you know, I don't want to offend people, you know, because I am thinking of the other person, not myself, and that I might face rejection. No, no, we don't talk to people about Jesus. I just show them. I just show them by being nice and by volunteering for charity and by having a fish on my car. Because a number of times I've looked in the rearview mirror and I've seen people on their knees in repentance when they've seen that fish. No, I don't, we don't have to talk to people. We don't actually have to tell anyone. We've got to be sensitive to people, not offend people. Anyway, we've got evangelists who can do that kind of thing, so let's just leave it to them. And do you know what? People will come. If they're interested, they'll come and find us. They'll come and find us in church. Now, that might be a bit of a parody but actually I think it's frighteningly close to the mark for some. By the way, it's okay to have a fish on your car. <laughs> Feel free. There's a couple of problems with this whole idea that we should keep quiet about Jesus. One is far more important than the other. The less important problem is that without the second S of bless, it would say bless. And that doesn't really do it, does it? It's not really very, very punchy. But that's not really important. The real reason is that Keeping quiet about Jesus simply doesn't line up with what the Bible tells us to do. Saved. For example, Romans 10, 13 to 14 says, Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? In other words, how will people hear about Jesus unless someone tells them? And then there's 1 Peter 3, 15 to 16, which is where we're going to focus today. In your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behaviour in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. And I'll come back to the second part of that a bit later. But it is clear that we are to always be prepared to speak about Jesus, to give the reason for the hope that we have. Because when you live your life for Jesus, when you do the preaching of the gospel at all times with your life, as that quote suggests, because you're listening to people, you're serving them, you're blessing them, then people will ask you why. And that requires a response. It requires you to speak. Maybe that quote should read instead, preach the gospel at all times and when, not if, when necessary, use words, because it will become necessary. I mean, can you imagine if Oxfam or a similar organisation said, feed the hungry, and if necessary, use food? It's nonsensical, isn't it? It doesn't work, because you can't, do, you can't separate the two things out. You, it, using food is integral to feeding the hungry, just as our words and the way we live our lives together, you can't separate them out. They are integral to preaching the gospel, to seeing ordinary people changed by Jesus to change the world. So we have to use words. We can't keep quiet about Jesus. But then what do we say? I mean, this is the thing, isn't it? This is the fear. I, won't, I, I, just, I just won't know what to say. I'm not very good at, at this kind of thing. I won't know what to say. I don't... You know, I don't have the answers to all those really hard questions people ask. You know, the questions that when they ask them, it makes me question my own faith. I don't have the answers, or I don't really know the Bible very well. Now, some of you might have learned some very clever ways of illustrating the gospel. Like, you know, you can draw the, a bridge on the back of a napkin, that kind of thing. Or you might be really up on your apologetics, defending the faith. How to answer those tough questions. How to engage intellectually with someone on matters of life and faith and and the universe, and that's all very well, and I love all of that. I love uh, sort of looking at apologetics because it gives me a great confidence that there are answers to all those tough questions, really good answers. It gives me confidence, but there's a problem, uh, well, there's a couple of potential problems. 
One is that if you just focus on illustrations and apologetics, defending the faith, intellectualism, it can become rather impersonal. And then the second problem is that just not everybody is wired in that way. Not everybody thinks in that way. But there is one thing that we do all have that doesn't require great theological depth or intellectual prowess or the ability to memorise loads of different illustrations and you know what it is, don't you? It's your story. We all have a story. Your own personal story is potentially the most powerful evangelistic tool that you have. And so I want to look at three aspects of this today. First is the power of story. And then second thing will be telling your story and then finally living your story. So the power of story. Stories are powerful. Again, we, we know that. I think as human beings, we connect with stories in, in very deep and meaningful ways. They, they, they resonate with us. They have the power to move us. They have the power to stir us. Particularly when we can identify with someone or something in that story. Whether that's a fictitious story or a real life story. So why is this? Why are stories so powerful? Well, I think it's because we are made in the image of a storytelling God. And we're part of the story that he is telling, the story that is unfolding, that big story of human history, of redemption, the story of God that is unfolding in history. That story goes, I mean, a very simple framework for that story is God made the world and it was good. Sin corrupted the world. Jesus, the hero, redeems the world. And one day God will ultimately restore everything. That's the framework of that great big story that we're all part of and we are all caught up in that story we're all trying to find our place in that particular story and so stories of any type resonate with us because actually they always point us to something bigger they point us to some sort of meaning in life which is beyond us some meaning in in how our lives are unfolding and how the world's unfolding it tries to, to point us to meaning and that overarching narrative is really the framework for all the stories that we tell and all the stories that we're captured by. I mean, think of your favourite stories. Is there a story that really makes you cry? It just moves you. Or a story that gets you going, it stirs you up. Because what you'll find when you think about it, your, your favourite story, and you all have different ones, is that the central theme or the central themes of that story are all just reflections of the big story. Of the um, find the meaning in that big story. So Lord of the Rings, for example. I love Lord of the Rings. I've read the books. I've watched the films um, several times. And, but it's a classic story of good against evil. It, it's the, the world's been corrupted by evil. And then there's this unlikely hero. I mean, have we heard this story somewhere before? This unlikely hero who comes to rescue the world. And it's about longing for a better world. Is they're all threads of the big story that we're part of and that longing that we have and searching for meaning. Here's how an author called Mike Cosper puts it he says we live in a world that was meant for glory but is now tragically broken we hunger for redemption and we seek it in a myriad of ways that's the story we're all involved in and so he says so we tell stories that reveal the deep longing of the human heart for redemption from sin for a life that's meaningful for love that lasts we tell stories about warriors overcoming impossible odds to save the world Stories about how true love can make the soul feel complete. Stories about horrific, prowling villains carrying out a reign of terror, only to be vanquished by an unexpected hero. Stories about friendships that don't fall apart. Stories about marriages that last. Stories about life, death and resurrection. We tell other stories too. Because the world is like a faded beauty who looks in the mirror, remembering her youth, mourning the long-gone glory of Eden. She's now battered and scarred, not merely by age, but by tragedy, war, and defeat. And she feels all too heavily how far she's fallen. And in her sadness, she tells mournful tales of glory lost, of heroes who fail and unravel, of sin and consequences, of evil that triumphs and prowls, of darkness that swallows all who draw near. And he's saying that all those things, they're all... They're the plot lines of all the stories we tell. You can fit all the stories we tell into a few different plot lines. Whether it's about good against evil, a hero, a villain, love, friendship, hope, or conversely, it's all about loss and tragedy and hopelessness and darkness. But they're all stories that resonate with us in some way because they're all threads of that overarching story we're all part of. It all comes from that big story of God. So we find very personal meaning in stories. So stories are powerful. 
and our own personal stories, our real life stories, as ordinary as they may seem, are also very powerful. Because the stories that we tell of our own lives are all part of that big story that God is telling. They're all part of the big the big narrative of life, and so they're powerful. I became a Christian through hearing someone tell their story. And that was a very powerful moment for me when I was 17. Now, my story is not nearly as dramatic as the story I heard on that day, but it is my story. It's mine, and it's real. And no one can take it away from me. Nobody can deny it. You know, it's very difficult to argue with someone's lived experience. It's very difficult to say, no, you're wrong. That's wrong. It's somebody's lived experience. And because it's all about how my story has intersected with God's story, and it's changed the course of my life, then it's powerful because God is in it. We heard from Ahmed there in the video at the beginning about the key for him coming to faith was his wife's story, both how it was displayed in her life, but also how she spoke about it, how, how Jesus got her through this particular tough time, how she came to faith. It's just very real and ordinary life. And all the stories we've featured in the series so far have been deliberately very ordinary in one sense, extraordinary in another sense, but very ordinary, God breaking into everyday life through his people being faithful in prayer and in loving people in all sorts of different ways. Or think about when we have baptism mornings here. The story doesn't have to be dramatic to be profoundly moving because it's real and it's someone's lived experience of how good God is and of how we have found our hope in him and that's a hope that the world outside is crying out for. So stories are powerful. Your story even yours, is powerful. Because it might be that God has put someone in your life, there's someone on your blessed list that only you can reach with your story. So stories are powerful. So it's worth spending some time thinking about your story, reflecting on it, about how you tell your story. So if you're in a blessed small group, you'll know we've been encouraging people in those small groups to think through their story and to shape it and to tell your story in in roughly three minutes. And there's a basic story framework that you can use to do that. And essentially it's before, during and after. Okay, so what was life like before following Jesus? Before you made that commitment of following Jesus? What were your priorities in life? What were your hopes and your dreams? What kind of a person were you? What was life like? And it'll be different for everybody. But then what brought you to Jesus? How did that happen? Was it a sudden thing or was it a a very gradual journey over several years? Was there a key moment or a key event or a key person involved? a, A revelation involved? How did you come to follow Jesus? How did you come to put your trust in him? And then, what has life been like since? What difference has Jesus made in your life? Has there been a cost to following him? Has anything changed in those things you mentioned in the first section, in your, in your priorities, in your hopes and your dreams, in, in your perspective on life? So before, during and after. These are good things for us to think through, to, to reflect on and get clear in your mind, really the story of what God has done in your life. But please don't be tempted to manipulate your story or embellish it in any way to make it more dramatic because your story will resonate with people because it's real not because it's sensational so it's your story it's personal to you and what God has done in your life now as I said before it's hard for people to to argue with lived experience and it's hard for people to argue with life change where there has been life change. Now again, your story may not be that you were once a a drug-dealing, murdering Satan worshipper who now you found Jesus, your life has turned around and you're now going into prison, sharing your story and you're seeing mass revival break out. That might not be your story, but there does have to be some change in your life. There has to be a difference that knowing and following Jesus makes in your life. The passage I read earlier from 1 Peter starts by saying, in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. When you do that, when you set him apart in your heart as Lord, in other words, you'd say, he is, he's number one. He is who I listen to. He's who I follow. He's who I obey. He's who I worship. He is the object of my worship in my life because we all worship something. So this is saying, that's Jesus for me. He's, he's first in my life. When you do that, it makes you different. It has to. It can't not make you different because you experience his grace. And you can't not be changed by experiencing the grace of God. You, you can't. 
You, you know his forgiveness in your life. You can't not be changed by the forgiveness of God. You know what it means to have purpose in this life and, and a hope that goes beyond this life. You, you handle relationships differently. You make financial decisions differently. Your priorities, your hopes, your, your attitudes to career, to, to work and all those kind of things, it changes. You can't not change when you meet Jesus. Now, of course, we're all works in progress. You know, I'm not talking about perfection here. We're all works in progress. We all face challenges and struggles in life. There may be areas in our lives where actually we haven't seen the change we'd like to see or the frustration of kind of recurring struggles over and over again. I just don't seem able to overcome. That's all part of life. But if you've met Jesus and nothing in your life has changed then you didn't meet Jesus. Because he changes you. And he is changing you. If you say you follow Jesus, but following Jesus hasn't changed you, it's not really Jesus you're following. It doesn't make sense for that to happen. Have you set apart Christ as Lord in your heart? If you have, you have a story to tell. As flawed as you might be, you have a story to tell. You have some change in your life that has happened. And if you haven't set him apart as Lord in your heart, you can do that at any time. You can do it today if you want. So there's a basic story shape before, during, and after. And it's a really good thing to think through. But of course, we don't always get the chance to share our story in that way. It doesn't always fit into the conversation to start talking about your three-minute story. It's not always natural. Sometimes you get the opportunity, but probably not usually. So I'm just going to show you this video of Val. Uh, Val Foreman, many of you know Val, she's been in the church for years and she used to work in the church office as well. She attends our Hazelmere site. This is a great example of what sharing your story can look like. Because of my illness, I have carers in, in the morning to help me. And this one particular lady had been worried because she'd had cancer twice and had it she was quite anxious that it was back for the third time, so we'd have to talk about it. And it was quite amazing how it happened, really. I'd been to the hospital the day before for a check-up. So when she came, she said to me, um, how did you get on the hospital yesterday? And I said, well, I have had a good news, and there it is. It's just a case of monitoring how, how much worse I've got. And she stopped what she was doing and said, how do you cope with having such dreadful illness and yet still believe in God? How do you cope with that? And I was really put on the spot then. I didn't have time to think of any clever answers or a Bible verse or anything like that. So I just said, well, I don't blame God for my illness. I'm not angry. Because he's promised to be with me as I as I live and cope with it. And with that, she sort of gasped and burst into tears. And so she was sitting on the bed and I was comforting her. And she said, she got her breath back. She said, a really strange thing happened to me just as you were saying that. It was as though somebody put their arms around me and hugged me. And I said, well, that's God's love. God loves you. That's how he shows it. Now, did you hear the amazing story Val told her carer? It was very simple, wasn't it? It Basically, what she said was, God's with me. He's promised to be with me, so I don't blame him for this. That was it. That's all she said. And it was profound. It was powerful. That is as much sharing your story as sharing your before, during and after story. Because that is Val's lived experience. That is the part of her story that was relevant to share in that moment and in response to that question and in response to that conversation. And it was powerful. It was profound. There were no lengthy theological explanations about suffering and healing There were no Bible verses, but God used it powerfully. That is sharing your story. 
When Glenn Scrivener came to speak at our Leaders' Day, he came and spoke on a Sunday morning and he came to our Leaders' Day as well in September. And he encouraged us to have what he called some sentences up your sleeve. And by that he meant just aspects of your story that fit very naturally into conversation. So how would you finish these sentence starters? That's what I love about Jesus. Or that's what I love about Christianity. Or I couldn't have gotten through this without Jesus. Or that's what I love about my church. How would you... How would you complete those senses from your lived experience? So you can see how these would fit very easily naturally into conversation. So for example, if you have somebody, you're talking to somebody, and they say, you know, I just, I just feel like such a failure. You say, oh, but, but that's what I love about Jesus. See, because, because his utter acceptance and love of me doesn't depend on my performance. In fact, he meets me at my worst and he wants my very best. That's what I love about Jesus. Or somebody saying, I really don't like, I just don't like religion. It's just such a turn off me. Oh, but that's what I love about Christianity. He said, it's not about religion. It's not about following a list of rules and trying to make yourself better. It's about grace. It's about love and relationship. It's about a God who's come near to us. He's done the work. That's what I love about my faith. Or somebody might be saying to you, I just, I just don't know how I'm going to cope. I don't know how I'm going to cope with this. And you say, you know, no, it's really tough. But do you know something? I would never have got through this situation in my life without Jesus. I didn't know how I was going to cope either. But Jesus got me through. Or somebody is saying, I I went to this place, I just felt so judged and unwelcome. Oh, but that's what I love about my church. Because everyone is invited. Everyone is welcome. it's just so friendly and it's so diverse. It's the most diverse place you'll find. You've got to come and check it out. Sentences up your sleeve. They've got to be from your lived experience, not made up. It's got to be actually, this is really what you think. This is how you've experienced these things. But it's important to tell your story in whatever way is appropriate to that particular situation, that particular conversation. It's also important how you tell your story. So 1 Peter 3 that I read before, we're encouraged to do it, we're told to do it with gentleness and respect. Gentleness and respect. It's very easy to approach conversations, it's very easy to approach that um, about faith and maybe conversations where those difficult questions are being asked. It's very easy to approach that conversation with the goal of winning the argument. And I'm going to show you that I am right and you're wrong and say you need to get with my view of things. You need to come over to my side of the fence. Now that's when we stop listening And we start shutting people down. And we stop showing gentleness and respect. Don't try to win the argument. Try to win the person. It's far more important. You don't need to win the argument because their salvation doesn't depend on you. You can't save anybody. Only God can save people. Only God has the power to change anyone's heart. So actually whether you win the argument or not is really irrelevant. If somebody believes and somebody comes to faith after interactions with you, that's to the glory of God, not you. Our role is to be his witness. It's to testify to the truth. It's to testify to the difference that he and the truth has made in our lives, regardless of the response that you get. But to do that from a place of genuine love. Because it has a profound impact on people when you see, when they see that you really do love them and you care about them and you persist with them and that you're not just trying to win an argument. Okay, so I've talked about the power of story and telling your story. So final brief point is living your story. So a reminder of those verses from 1 Peter 3. In your heart set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behaviour in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. This is talking about the hope that you have now. The hope that's evident in your life now. The good behaviour in Christ that is on display in your life now. It's about living a life in the now, that causes people to ask you to give the reason for the hope that you have. In other words, the the, the point is this. Before seeking to bless others, the question is, are you really following Jesus yourself? Are you living your story? Because you can't give away what you haven't got. It's very difficult to give away the good news of Jesus if the good news of Jesus is not evident in any way in your own life right now. In 2 Corinthians 3, the Apostle Paul is saying to the Corinthians that Paul and his companions don't need letters of recommendation. 
Because he says to them, you yourselves are our letter. Written on our hearts, known and read by everybody. I love that. You yourselves are our letter. You're our recommendation because people see your lives. How about you? Is your life like an open letter that is seen by everybody? Like an open book, a letter of recommendation for Jesus? Are you able to share with people what God is doing in your life right now? How he's still shaping your life? How he's still transforming you? I mean, the the crunch question is this. Does anybody ever ask you to give the reason for the hope that you have? Does anybody ever ask you that? Does what is on display in your life cause people to ask those questions? Or is your story more about a historical event? Something that happened a few years ago or several years ago? Rather than being a lived experience right now. See, the cross of Christ, while it's something that happened in history, it is far more than a historical event. If that's all it was, it would make no difference to anybody today. It's just something that happened 2,000 years ago. has no impact today. It becomes irrelevant. But we know it's far more than that. We know that the cross of Christ had eternal consequences, eternal impact. That he died on that cross to deal with your sin and my sin so that we can walk in freedom now. And then Jesus was raised to life. He was resurrected. He, was, he defeated death to give us new life, to give us resurrection power, to give us life and life to the full to be lived in the now. As well as that sure and certain hope of the glorious future to come. The cross and the resurrection of Jesus are not merely historical events. They have power to change lives today. And Jesus' activity in your life mustn't be just a historical event. How is he changing you now? What's he doing in your life now? Because the same power that raised Christ from the dead now lives in you, is at work in you. Your story is powerful because it's part of God's story. So tell it. Tell your story. Tell it with gentleness and respect. Tell it when the opportunity arises. We're not about trying to force anything on anybody. But tell your story and live your story. Live it now. In Acts 18, in a a verse which is very significant for us as a church, God says this to Paul. He says, do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. For I am with you and I have many people in this city. And God has said to us as a church that he has many people in this place. He has many people in this town who don't know Jesus and we are to reach. That's his mission for us. But the point is, he's given us that mission, so he's with us. He is with us, so do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. Don't keep quiet about Jesus. Why would you? Why would anybody keep quiet about Jesus? He's amazing. Keep blessing those around you, praying for them, listening to them, eating together, serving them, so that they ask you for the reason for the hope that you have. And to come back to Francis of Assisi, preach the gospel at all times. And then when necessary, when the opportunity arises, use words. Use your story and use it boldly. Amen. Amen.